Welcome. It's 5.25 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. 7, 5, 19, question mark. I'm going to be continuing with the uh, Hiding America series that I honestly wasn't even intending on it being a series. It was just, you know, when I got this book by Schrag, I consumed it in like two days because of all the all the gaps that it was filling in and I do wish there were more books like this unfortunately a lot of the material that even guys like Schrag have to pull from it's oftentimes um, narratives designed by opposition forces so they literally have to uh, extract good information from, for lack of a better term, bad publications or materials. Ones that are designed uh, to uh, achieve a different result. So um, there's just not a lot out there like this. And finding it is not all that easy either. It used to be, even about two, three decades ago, that you could go to a, a book dealer, a bookstore, and um, the proprietor, the book dealer, he would usually be extremely knowledgeable in types of literature available and if you were looking for something in particular and he wasn't uh, too up on it he would know someone who was um, you know fortunately uh, some boutique stores like that are popping back up which is just fantastic because uh, honestly Amazon has absolutely wrecked um, literature I've been uh, Amazon's probably been one of the worst things for literature um, and the internet in, in a lot of ways uh, so that's why I I honestly thought I could kind of hit some of those points relatively quick but who am I fooling I'm gonna start this out with uh, a little section of a book that was written relatively recently, which was entitled um, The Zionist Attack on White Civilization by an anonymous author. At first, I thought, well, he, he goes over 125 points that are usually used against whites and white civilization um, and basically debunks them as he goes 125 points and I've I've really considered actually making this a series it would be a pretty long series um, but it's it just full of great material and great arguments and counter arguments because um, if you're white you've uh, probably been the brunt of these kinds of um, ridiculous arguments uh, and so it's a great tool for providing uh, you with an answer to these things um, but th it directly relates to <clears throat> the the next portion that I wanted to uh, get into from the Shrog book and this is point one of this book the Zionist attack on white civilization. Uh, like I was saying, I, at first I thought it would have been better, wouldn't it have been better to call it uh, the Jewish attack? But I don't think so. The Zionist attack is, I think, far better because here's why. The term Zionist is far more broad so sometimes it's not really correct that people they 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 mix the terms up I think sometimes incorrectly 
too often. But in this instance, I think it is correct because, you know, humanity and um, more specifically white civilization is being and has been for some time being attacked and not specifically just by tribal Jews, but Zionists, which can describe those who are not genetically Jewish, who just, uh, because of greed, selfishness, uh, power, so on, have decided to be um, the lapdogs of powerful Jews. Um, it can also be those who, who just have you know their own interest in mind uh, people who are part of the military industrial complex corporations it they do weave together very tightly of course um however the the thing is you know it's not just a jewish thing i mean yeah they are acting in a tribal way and in a sense they they act based on their own uh, interests, um, which you can't blame any uh, people for per se. The problem is uh, they don't only act like that. They, they, they do absolutely act parasitically, and that can be proven uh, quite easily, um, and destructively. Uh, I, even though parasitic behavior is destructive, there's a number of different destructive behaviors that can uh, be undertaken by one people towards another. Um, but along with them, there are so many non-Jews that are willing to exploit their own people uh, just for oftentimes utterly uh, menial selfish gain I mean not even they're not even getting that much of a payoff you know their payoff is they get to be uh, the slaves and servants of their Jewish masters um, as opposed to them gaining far more. Think about like journalists uh, that, that aren't Jews that are working for Jewish uh, publications, which are most of them. Um, they're not even getting that much out of it except being able to s <laughs> scrape away a living. Yet they're still willing to betray their own people for the interests of another people. And that's just sick. So, yeah, I think in this case, Zionist is pretty appropriate because it describes a very wide uh, variety of people that are willing to go along with the agenda of one particular uh, race or tribe of people against their own people, against other people's, so on and so forth. Point one says, <clears throat> how can you, as a white person claim that North America, being Canada and the United States, belongs to white people, when in fact, white people simply stole the continent from the Indians? The answer, whites have been in North America long before Christopher Columbus rediscovered North America. I believe that you're aware that there are remains of white Scandinavian Viking settlements on the east coast of North America, especially in Newfoundland. What century did these men make their discovery in? Is there any other scientific evidence proving that other groups of white explorers have been in North America long before the Vikings? Well, yes, it turns out there is. You see, thousands of years ago, Europeans living in modern-day France, called the Salutrians, used to hunt wild animals for food. There's all kinds of archaeological evidence providing that these Europeans, who lived before and during the last Great Ice Age of 17,000 years ago, hunted animals with a special arrowhead attached to a spear. 
Now, you have to remember we are talking about a period of time during the Stone Age. I'm sorry, it's some some of these assumptions I disagree with, but we'll there let's keep going just to get to their their point here, okay? Uh, no pun intended because we are talking about Clovis points. Europeans hadn't yet discovered or invented metal. <laughs> So we had to make our arrowheads out of rock. <laughs> Sorry. Now, these special arrowheads were 100 times sharper than a steel razor. You can see them for yourself if you go to the museums where they are on display. These unique arrowheads are called Clovis points. They aren't found in Asia or Siberia, but are found in Europe. The real interesting fact is that they have been recently discovered here in North America as well. Uh, do, do, I do want to comment on this, this idea of Stone Age, um, <laughs> before they had metal and all that. Uh, again, just like the assumption that there were people from Europe coming to America early, as opposed to there just being whites in America from as far long past as you can go, they've been here. Um, and them literally, um, I don't know if I want to use a term like dying out, but becoming such a, 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 an amazing minority here through various um, incidents that occurred and ending up in other parts of the world for quite some time. So again, it's an assumption that they weren't just here uh, from the oldest times imaginable. The other assumption is that, for instance, and I heard that I hear this said all the time, that um, it was a lack of having metals or working with metals that would cause a lot of various people to use stone for arrowheads, spearheads, or uh, different cutting instruments. Well, that's, again, it's just an assumption. In fact, if you can um, fashion stone, which you can, into implements that are sharper than metal, um, you have to consider that smithing all of those uh, arrowhead uh, and, and spearheads, uh, knives, and so on, um, is going to take a great deal of time. Um, mining the ore, extracting the metal, working with the metal, making those points just to, in many instances, you're going to lose the point of that arrow or that spear. Um, so you have to consider that, whereas the stones being used would be far more plentiful, probably rather quick to mill into arrowheads and spearheads, and so not such a great loss if, you know, it ends up going into a, an animal, a person, you miss and it goes into a, another stone, gets chipped, broken, so on and so forth. I mean, your only other option is to either use um, high-grade metals, which don't corrode, which are valuable, are actually used as money and have been uh, since time immemorial. Um, so you wouldn't really want to do that. Uh, and then the other metals that you could more readily get a hold of and, and use for things like that are metals that oxidize. They more easily corrode or rust. Um, and so besides the fact that it would take longer to smith those things and, and mill and work those things, um, you know, they uh, the, the metals you would want to use were probably a bit um, more apt to corrode or rust and, you know, you throw a rusty spear at somebody, and chances are they may get tetanus, and you don't want that. But I'll continue with his point. He says, however, the Clovis points 
are not present along the route of the Bering Land Bridge. So that means that these arrowheads did not come from Asia, as they have not been found on that continent. They are an exclusive white man arrowhead, which have been unearthed in Europe and now here in North America. So how did they get here? The answer is, which is supported by ample scientific evidence, including white DNA and ancient skeletal remains, that during the last Great Ice Age, which covered the Atlantic Ocean, with ice as far south as southern France, our ancient food gatherers had to venture out into the sea to locate additional food due to harsh winter, which had killed off um, yada yada. And, and he goes on about how they would have come here uh, from uh, the Salutrians were supposed to live in like southern France and Spain and Portugal and all that. As opposed to saying that, okay, well, these same people that dwelt here that we found these Clovis Point spear heads from also lived in in Europe. So you could you could go one way or the other. They're just assuming one narrative. So he also continues and says, uh, science that even recently discovered white skeletal remains here in North America, like the Kennewick Man, which we're going to get into in the Shrog book. Um, he also mentions a couple of documentaries that were made, one of them specifically produced by BBC, which if you watch that, I think it's called Ice Age Columbus uh, or Stone Age Columbus, you can tell it's a complete hit piece. It's, it is them trying to uh, somehow control the information because what tends to happen is oftentimes artifacts get found and brought to light uh, before they and the Smithsonian or the Army Corps of Engineers or whomever it is, the National Geographic Society, can, can work in tandem to cover these things up. They end up coming out, they can't be covered up, they can't be hidden, they can't be denied, and we're going to see how hard they've worked at trying to cover up and deny the facts present in Kennewick Man as well. Um, so one thing that he, a uh, point that he makes uh, is that whites have been, there is un plenty of evidence that whites have been in North America since thousands of years ago. Now, whether you're willing to believe that sort of Ice Age, Carbon-14 kind of uh, dating techniques or not, uh, I guess is irrelevant. The fact is that we have found um, evidence through artifacts of whites living in North America from very, very long ago. Um, and again, um, why weren't they as plentiful when say Columbus if you believe that narrative or when people started coming back here uh, from Europe why weren't there more white uh, tribes here well, one thing is we don't know how many there were in the first place because so much has been covered up about this land and its inhabitants um, the other thing is it's very easy to breed out white genes <clears throat> so for instance the Mandans <coughs> from yesterday um, just the fact that they had still uh, very predominant white features says that they were not breeding much with the other peoples of different races around them uh, however again this is one of the reasons why um, the media and the powers that be trying like crazy to encourage whites to interbreed with other races like if they don't do that somehow they're uh, bad people what they're doing through just encouraging that is trying to affect a genocide on us because we don't have dominant genes um, so as soon as you start doing that um, the those dominant genes from those other darker races will uh, take over 
very quickly. So it's not really hard to breed many of those genetic markers out. He also says maybe a lot of them were killed by, you know, overwhelming amounts of other tribes that we have called Indians in North America. And based on the behavior of a lot of the tribes uh, that were here a few hundred years ago, that's entirely likely as well. And he also mentions the, uh, there are, uh, there's a link, uh, this book is actually full of links if you get it off archive. Um, this version has in all the points links, which if you just open it up in, in Acrobat um, and click on the links, it will take you to either the various articles that he refers to or websites he refers to or videos, uh, either at Vimeo or YouTube. He mentions the uh, 13 thousand year old white skulls that have been identified as white or caucasoid found here in North America. So very interesting. Now <clears throat> before I start this particular reading, uh, I'm not just going to read straight through first off because uh, there are, are large areas uh, in this chapter where uh, the, the author is putting a lot of his own little rabbit trails in. And, and uh, there's also just a, a lot of material that's not pertinent to what I'm focusing on. So I'm going to start out before uh, I read this little portion concerning when they got to the Nez Perce village. So the Nez Perce named that by the French. And again, this is something that I stated earlier. Not only um, tribes that were here in North America, but a lot of uh, geographical features <coughs> like rivers, uh, mountains, and other things had one name that they were called by the various inhabitants. And then oftentimes they had another name uh, given by either Spanish or French or English or Dutch or Scandinavian and so on. Keep that in mind because, the, the, for instance, the Nez Perce tribe were named that by the French because um, many of them had pierced noses. And it literally means pierced nose. Nez Perce. The thing I'm going to bring up before I, I read these couple of paragraphs and move on. So they met them around Idaho. They had gone past the Continental Divide. This was after they moved on from Fort Mandan and were heading westward. Um, they didn't have any horses at this time. And what I'm going to read here not only goes against this sort of narrative, and I was taught this in school. I'm going to assume a lot of you others were as well. The idea that horses, except for the small Mustang, was not indigenous to North America, um, which I would say is crap. Well, first off, we're going to find out why. The Appaloosa certainly was. Um, and the other thing is, I'll give you a good example of what's indigenous to where and how do we know that. There is a species of horse called the Arabian, but there's absolutely no evidence that it derived in Arabia. Um, it is just a title that was given to that breed of horse, which for all we know was just heavily sold in Arabia for quite some time. And somebody at some point just designated it as Arabian. Although Arabians were found being used 
by many different peoples in many parts of the world. It's just assumed that they got them all from Arabia, which is not the best place to raise and breed horses per se, nor to use horses in that kind of landscape. You, you, your camel is a far better animal for that kind of um, environment. Another thing is, I touched on, an, on one video on the word Gamal in Obri. You'll see that in Hebrew too, and they'll directly transliterate it into camel. And they'll say that that word Gamal, which is the G, M, or M, and L, Gamal, that means camel. Well, if it, if it does, and I'm not sure that it does, I'll tell you why. If it does, first off, there are remains of skeletons of a species of camel that have been found in North America, in the Southwest. They call it camelops. You can Wikipedia it. It's another one of those discoveries that they weren't able to just bury. That's one thing. But another thing that I think is, is far more relevant if you look at the word Gamal, it is, for one thing, translated or transliterated, camel, and they say that it's this animal like the dromedary. Uh, however, the other usage you'll see of Gamal in the Bible is as equate um, to do one thing to equal another. Um, look it up. Um, for instance, one of the earlier usage, uh, uses of it is when Joseph's brothers say that he's going to repay what we did now that our father's dead. That would be like Genesis 50 or 51, and they use the word gamal, equate. Well, it's really interesting when you check into um, the etymology of words and you look up <clears throat> horse riding, horse keeping, horse breeding, anything to do with horses. It is equestrian. And the root of that is equate or equal. And they'll tell you, well, it's because, you know, having a horse uh, made all men equal. I don't know if that's true or not. But what's interesting is the, f the furthest back you go, and this goes back to Latin, and it comes from Latin, the, the root word for breeding and having anything to do with horses is equate. And the way that gamal is used, when it's not transliterated into camel, the way it's used in the Bible, outside of the transliteration of camel, is an equation to equate, to make equal one thing for another. That's interesting also. The last thing is, out of all the different animals that are described as uh, pack animals, animals that you ride, so on and so forth, the translators of the Bible, so the people who came up with our modern lexicon, which were most likely Masoretic Jews, and the modern translators, uh, mostly Anglicans and various reformers who um, are questionable folks oftentimes, um, by fiat have made a number of these uh, words used for various animals into animals that more, more suit a Middle Eastern uh, scenario and environment, whereas uh, these animals could possibly just be different variations of horses, horse breeds, and so on. Um, the whole point to that is that nobody has really proven these things beyond the shadow of a doubt. Okay, so I mean, those things in mind, I'll move forward. Uh, Shrog says, 
Lewis and Clark were intrigued with the Nez Perce for many reasons, not the least of which were their beautiful and unusual horses, the Appaloosa, a highly refined breed. It was exclusive to their tribe, even though neighboring tribes coveted it. When Lewis saw the Appaloosa, he compared them to some of the more elegant horses of Europe. Uh, something else that's interesting is in the Bible, both Old Testament and New mentions a type of speckled horse when it gives different horses, different colors, like for instance, you'll find that in the book of Zechariah. He continues, the Nez Perce had mastered the art of breeding. Unknown to other tribes, such as mating the best stallion with the best mare and practicing castration of lesser stallions, all the other tribes caught wild horses or stole them from each other. This is something that distinguished the Nez Perce. They were another one of those tribes that was uh, quite a bit different than the tribes around them. It's generally believed that horses were brought to the New World by the Spanish around 1780 and that the Plains Native Americans acquired them soon after that. Yet even if the Spanish breeds had been rushed to the Pacific Northwest as soon as they came off the Spanish galleons, the time span from 1780 would have been insufficient to achieve the specific genetic developments present when Lewis and Clark first saw the horses in September 1805. So basically what he's saying is the Nez Perce had been breeding these horses for a very, very long time. They had an intimate knowledge of this particular kind of horse and how to breed it. Now, how they came about that knowledge, I don't know. That's a, a whole nother subject right there. But I've heard this idea before. And like I said, you were probably all taught, like I was, that horses were not even indigenous to North America. The, the most they might do is say, maybe, maybe the Mustang. And that's about as much as they'll give. Uh, I think that's nonsense. Uh, I also think another one of those claims that is just crap because of the ecological effects that it would have before and after is the claim that honeybees were not indigenous to North America and that they were also brought here by the Spanish. Now he goes on to say, and this is all based on his assumptions, that the Appaloosa were an ancient Chinese breed. Um, what he says is ample evidence of Chinese trade um, present uh, along the West Coast is actually a very small amount of evidence. There is some, uh, don't get me wrong, but um, definitely not ample evidence that the Nez Perce got these Appaloosas from China. One thing he brings up is how there appears to be Appaloosa horses in ancient Chinese art. But again, you have to employ an assumption that the Appaloosas were first in China and then came to North America as opposed to the other way around. All assumptions. It is interesting to note, he continues, that in this beautiful valley where the Nez Perce lived freely, there's a mound so large it looks like a hill. According to local legend, this mound is supposed to contain deep within the heart of a great monster killed during the beginning of the world. There's no mention of this hill or its intriguing mythology in any of the journals of the men from the expedition, despite very clear instructions from President Jefferson for soil samples and the like. Did Lewis and Clark see the mound? How is it possible they could have missed it? Well, I'm not sure why Schrag keeps asking these questions because as he has documented throughout his book, Lewis and Clark somehow throughout all of their travels from when they left all the way to the Pacific and back there are these major 
features of the land, uh, such as mounds, which, if I can just rabbit trail off mounds for a second, um, how do we know, based on what have been found in a lot of these mounds, how do we know that mounds weren't often used in the same way that today we use landfills for our refuse, certain types of refuse, and that the general inhabitants that built these mounds um, were just more aesthetic or believed that if they had to, to bury uh, a lot of things, that it was best to do it in some sort of aesthetic way as opposed to just making big hills. Now, we still do that in, in the modern age. Oftentimes, um, there are landfills that are specifically designed in a certain way so that when they are finally done and they've settled, they've uh, retrieved all the gases out of them and so on, and they know that the ground is stable, they're going to be building things on top of them or making them into... Uh, parks, I've seen golf courses um, <laughs> made on them, and so on. But it is very interesting that somehow Lewis and Clark just kept missing these extremely important, uh, very telling uh, features, uh, such as mounds, earthworks, all kinds of things on their trip. I mean, it, it, it almost seems very ironic that uh, their group was called the Corps of Discovery when they kept somehow missing such absolutely obvious things that I'm sure uh, with all of these Indians that they were supposedly coming in contact with along the way, they would have, wouldn't, wouldn't you? If that was your job, that's what you were being paid for by the people of the United States to do. Every tribe you would come across, you would be asking them, what are the areas or features of interest around here that you would know of that would be of interest to us that we could see or record animals, plants, and features in the ground, buildings, structures? That's what I would be asking. And these guys obviously were a lot smarter than me, so... Why aren't they asking this? Why aren't they recording? I'm sure they were asking this. Why aren't they recording these things? Just seems like um, for... And, and the, everybody in this expedition, by the way, were highly rewarded for their service in one way or another. I mean, whether it was giving them huge parcels of land or like in the case of, you know, Lewis and Clark and a few other high-ups, in the core of discovery, you know, uh, Meriwether Lewis was made the governor of the extended Louisiana territory. Uh, Clark was made at first uh, um, the uh, head of, of Indian affairs and, and so on. Uh, they were very, very, very richly rewarded, both monetarily and with appointments and so on. Um, it seems absolutely um the the apogee of irresponsibility to uh, let all of these things escape um, being asked, noted, and recorded. And now, he goes on, the expedition was traveling a uh, particularly awe-inspiring territory rich in anthropological treasures when Clark wrote in his journal. In those narrows, the water was agitated in a most shocking manner. So they're in a tributary of the Snake River right now. Um, boils swell and whirlpools we passed with great risk, it being impossible to make a portage of the canoes. About two miles lower past a very bad place between two rocks, one large, in the middle of the river here, our canoes took in some water. I put all the men who could not swim on shore and sent a few articles, such as guns and papers, and landed at a village of 20 houses on the Stard. Um, I wonder if he meant the starboard side. I don't know. 
Uh, it looks like it, though, because he abbreviated it. In a deep basin where the river uh, appeared to be blocked up with immense rocks. It's important to, here to mention the intriguing area that surrounded the core of discovery during these last maneuvers that would bring them within view of the Pacific. The region described by Lewis and Clark no longer resembles the landscape described in Clark's journal. The area had long been gather, a gathering place for people from the Warm Springs, Yakama, Umatia, Nez Perce, and other tribes. Some, like the Wishram, Cloud, and Lishkam tribes, lived there permanently and fished with nets and spears between the Dallas and Salilo Falls. Now, I do acknowledge one of the points that Shrag is making, that <clears throat> the various engineering projects that the Army Corps of Engineers have done along the Columbia and Snake River just to name a couple. And they have done projects throughout the western United States. And I guarantee you, they have utterly changed the landscape there. As to what it was like, let's just say, when the first Spanish explorers were coming here and exploring, as opposed to changing. Um, some of these changes were made more recently. Some of these changes were made quite a long time ago and in some instances we don't even know how long ago it's amazing that the uh, army corps of engineers have existed um since before this country officially on paper as constitutional republic existed okay um and travels westward um that are very difficult to find good quality information on as far as what they were really doing what they were up to um had been taking place since again before this was even a constitutional republic on paper shrog goes on to mention um a lot of petroglyphs and um artifacts in this area so we're talking about we're talking about basically around the the area of say near Portland Oregon um, a bit before and then to the Pacific uh, let's see he continues later some of the oldest pictographs in North America were found in this area discoveries included sacred petroglyphs drawings chipped or ground into rock that depict tribal legends, hunting scenes, what appear to be alien beings, uh, and who knows what that means exactly, and mystical imagery. This is evidence of the extreme age of the gatherings that took place in the area. Salilo Falls now exists in the imagination. It has been reduced to a lake sitting behind the Dallas Dam since 1957. This reservoir eliminated important fishing grounds for many native tribes. For more than 10,000 years, Native Americans lived and fished in the Salilo Falls area, but today their ghosts remain silent and show no proof of the proud ancient heritage that once existed in that area. Now this part is interesting. <clears throat> the seeming erasure of history has much to do with the fact that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers owns this part of the Columbia River. In 1957, the Corps specifically chose the area of Salilo Falls to build a dam where hundreds of historical petroglyphs and perhaps more artifacts that would provide proof of an ancient technological civilization were to be found. Rising waters caused by the dam flooded the Salilo area, including the falls, burying forever the ancient petroglyphs, along with the ancient history of the Columbia Basin. Only 43 of the ancient rock symbols were chosen to be moved to a new location. I'm sure they chose the ones that best fit their narrative. Now, the thing is, he said that they did this in the 1950s. 
they put up that dam and flooded this out, so forever burying everything in this area. Not only the petroglyphs, but who knows, untold artifacts in this area. Obviously, they deemed that that whole area was far too dangerous to their narrative to leave it above water so that people could freely explore it and find more evidence that contradicted their story. We saw last time they did this same thing in North Dakota, right near the site that Lewis and Clark was supposed to have stayed with the Mandans. As I told you, you're going to find this over and over and over again. Whenever you find an important site, you're going to see the Army Corps of Engineers either ruining it with something they say is absolutely necessary or vital, um, or you're going to find that it gets turned into a national forest and thus protected so you cannot move freely around in it, or a national park. I mean, come on guys, um, they turned Yosemite into a national park while the Civil War was raging, right in the middle of the Civil War. They turned Yosemite, or Yosemite, into a national park, but somehow a bit to protect it, to protect it as a, a national, or in some cases, world heritage sites, they say these things are. Um, but for some reason, they thought that all of those petroglyphs and maybe artifacts and everything, this extremely old historical land that contained a lot of evidence of the older civilizations there, they thought that all of that would be best under a slackwater lake. Is that making any sense? Well, it does, if you understand the motives behind the people doing this stuff. Um... He says you can visit these remaining glyphs at the Washington Columbia Hills State Park, uh, about an hour and a half away from their original location, according to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And remember, he said that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers owns that whole area of the Columbia. What are they doing owning that whole area? This is, quote, the best place to see native petroglyphs in the Northwest, according to the Army Corps of Engineers, unless one has gills, in which case one can see the hundreds that are underwater of a slack lake that they created. Now, Schrag spends a good amount of time after that talking about Lewis and Clark's winter camp uh, along the Pacific uh, actually, he spends pages just talking about that and how they had to trudge to their winter camp and establish their winter camp and took a vote on what they would do. And there was a black and an Indian part of that vote. And wow, how historical that was. And so on. He does mention that <clears throat> the items, <clears throat> excuse me, the items that have been found along the western coast out of all the uh, artifacts he's aware of, the amount of artifacts linking to China are extremely scarce. Um, some of the artifacts have simply been assumed to be Chinese that have been found on the West Coast. There's no proof linking any of them to China. Um, there is claims that a few uh, skeletons have been found up around Vancouver that seem to be Asian skeletons. Oh, I don't doubt that. I mean, um, you know, the, the Inuits themselves have an appearance that is strikingly Asian. Um, I'm not saying I doubt that at all. And, and there would have been a great amount of time that this land would have sat uh, in ruin and barren, and many people may have come here and traded with the tribes that existed for many, many long centuries along the West Coast. Um, many various people may have simply sailed here and settled here. Um, I would imagine, like with anything else, most, most things would have started as trading posts and moved on from there. <clears throat> now, 
One must ask, though, why no specific Chinese or Japanese or so on and so forth tribes were really found uh, anywhere in North America. Now, he talks about some uh, remains, but like unlike with the Mandan um, and other whites of various uh, kinds that we've heard about, you don't really hear about tribes that seem Chinese, Japanese, and so on. It does look like a number of the Northwest tribes have bred with East Asians, though, I would have to say. And that's it's not just the Inuits. Now, here's kind of the meat of all of this. He uh, continues on page 82, the most alluring of all the Asian Pacific Northwest connections is the enigmatic and controversial Kennewick Man. Kennewick Man is the name given to the remains of a prehistoric man found on a bank of the Columbia River near Kennewick, Washington on July 28, 1996. While swimming in the river during the annual hydroplane races, two college students accidentally made the discovery of a man's skull. It turned out to belong to the most complete ancient skeleton ever found. The bones were dubbed the Kennewick Man. Immediately, the remains became embroiled in debates about the relationship between Native American religious rites and archaeology that launched a nine-year legal clash between scientists, the federal government, and Native American tribes. The tribes claimed Kennewick Man as their ancestor. The long dispute made the remains an international celebrity. The subject of documentaries, websites, books, and even the cover of Time magazine. The controversy became so convoluted that the long litigation process has relegated this amazing cultural discovery to a university basement. Today's secrets held by the Kennewick man continue to be, at least for the public, secret. The Benton County coroner, Floyd Johnson, reached out to a forensic anthropologist in Richland named Jim Chatters, who studied the bones before the detailed analysis could be made. About a month later, Chatters and Johnson announced that the skeleton was about 9,200 years old and that they speculated that the man appeared to be in his 40s or 50s when he died, making him very old for that period. Chatters and Johnson noted that the skeleton showed a healed broken arm and a healed broken rib, and they found a roughly one-inch basalt spear point embedded in the skeleton's pelvic bone, which was not the cause of death, according to them. Before a detailed scientific analysis was completed, a digital reconstruction of the skull revealed the features were Caucasoid features. When the media broke the story, a great deal of coverage emphasized a similarity in appearance between the Ken Kennewick man and the Star Trek The Next Generation actor, Patrick Stewart. This flurry of coverage served the purpose of telling the truth about the discovery of Kennewick Man, but it depicted the discovery as a joke. From, now, that all makes sense. What makes total sense is the fact that we're looking at a Caucasoid skeleton and one of the best preserved full skeletons that we've ever found. And wouldn't you know it, unlike all of those other skeletons that... Uh, aren't even skeletons. Sometimes they'll find a tooth or two, and they say they can re reconstruct the entire thing. And wouldn't you know it, those so-called discoveries seem to always fit their model, their contrived version of events and peoples and history and so on and so forth. But when the best, most complete skeleton is found, and before they can create enough controversy to get it basically to where nobody can touch it and it's just sitting collecting dust in a university basement 
before they can get that done, you've got a couple of guys looking at it and already determining that it's Caucasoid. Now, I promise you that it was that that really caused the, the huge stink and the legal storm. And if you guys want to believe that whomever these tribes were, that were claiming it was theirs, it was theirs, it was their ancestor, and that, and, and here's the whole deal. These tribes, and he doesn't mention exactly the tribes that I recall, that were saying that it was their ancestor, and they wanted the bones because they, those bones needed to be buried. I promise you, there were the same private interests that were financing and pressing those tribal officials to get involved in this, were giving them legal aid, telling them what to say and what to do. Um, they were the same people that made sure that this Kennewick man and all the discoveries that could be made by honestly studying it were buried. Um, <clears throat> he spends a lot of time just making uh, assumptions about how is it that ca Caucasians could end up being here in the American Northwest? Um, and again, assumptions. Uh, but everybody needs to really consider why it is that one of the best intact skeletons found in the world and North America <laughs> and just so happened to be determined as Caucasoid, ended up embroiled in the greatest um, legal battle over artifacts uh, of the modern era. Is it just a coincidence? Must be just a coincidence, right? Um, it says the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers owns the Columbia River shoreline through the Tri-Cities, so it claimed ownership of the skeleton. However, according to the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, or <laughs> NAGPRA, signed into law by President George H. W. Bush in 1990, so uh, Reagan's Bush, if human remains are found on federal lands, and their cultural affiliation can be established. The bones must be returned to the affiliated tribe. Based on this act, five Native American nations, the Nez Perce, Umatilla, Yakama, Wanapun, and Colville, claimed the remains as theirs. I'm sorry, he did name five of them. So basically five tribes had to be paid off in some way to fight desperately to bury some bones. Who? I'd, okay, just to speak plainly. Um. Who gives a crap? That it it is not something worth that much fighting over. But there was so much fighting over and so much legal embroilment. And again. If there's, if there's legal issues and lawyers involved in courts and everything, that takes money. That takes financing. There were people behind those tribes that were financing them and urging them to raise a huge stink because they knew if they could um, get enough factions with enough claims that essentially it would put that skeleton utterly off limits and they could just keep it tied up in legal bullcrap forever. He says in April 1998 to protect any other skeletons and artifacts from the curious hands of archaeologists the US Army Corps of Engineers covered the Kennewick site with 500 tons of rock fill. Five hundred tons, so <clears throat> that's a thousand thousand pounds, so a million pounds of rock fill. They covered the site where Kennewick was found. Now, d does anybody 
currently still doubt that <clears throat> factions of the U.S. government and entities that the U.S. government, us, we, our money finances like the Smithsonian, they have been financed by the U.S. government since the 40s, are working against us, are covering up, hiding the history and the geography and everything else they can about this country because there's something, there are something or things about this place that is highly damaging to them. Now, could it be that there are a lot of prophecies that exist about when the children of Israel are brought back to the land that they will eventually become, again, the owners of that land and of the lands of their ancient enemies that surrounded them, thus making them the owners and inhabitants of huge areas of the land? And you know, if the one who made it all and sustains it all gives it to somebody who is anyone else to argue with that. So there's got to be some really important reason why they have worked so feverishly to cover up so much about this land. <clears throat> He says, curiously, we find the Smithsonian Institution embroiled in the act. <laughs> curiously, with Douglas Osley, the Smithsonian anthropologist, taking over the disputed remains and refusing to turn them over to any of the native nations. He contends that the remains potential contributions to science are too great and that Kennewick man could not be linked to any one tribe. Osley, along with eight other anthropologists, filed a lawsuit on the matter in 1996 in the U.S. District Court of Portland, Oregon. And that's one of the reasons that they've been able to keep it under wraps without anybody, independent scientists, anthropologists, and so on, getting at it to do plenty of additional tests to tell us even more about it. Because when you get so many different factions that are <clears throat> laying legal claims to it, that's basically going to affect it being bound up, tied up, unavailable for us to get any good, uh, truthful, information extracted from it and that's the whole point of so many entities getting in on the act uh, so now the five nations fought that in court they got a judgment that there would at some point in the future be at least some anthropological studies done because again they could not link it to any tribe. Well, yeah, and for and again, it was already deemed by anthropologists before all this stink was raised to be Caucasoid. So what tribe is it going to be linked to? Is it as Caucasoid? <laughs> now they say the, the Army Corps of Engineers remains the legal guardian of Kennewick Man. And I would imagine like any other US government agency, it's going to take very good care of <laughs> uh, oh man so anyways um, they put them in the Burke Museum a neutral site agreeable to both the tribes and scientists because somebody told them the same people that hired the lawyers that paid them to raise a stink about this and everything they told them okay that's agreeable you're going to agree to that um Due to costly litigation process, all but the Umatias dropped their claims. The Umatia tribe of Native Americans requested custody of the remains, wanting to bury them according to their tribal tradition. However, researchers hoping to study the remains contested their claim. So yeah, the people behind all of this didn't want to sink too much money into the claims of five tribes. They said if one just keeps their claim alive, um, 
that is one possibility that they could get a ruling on and then the Umatia could bury those remains and then nobody can ever touch them. This is the whole point of all of this. They don't want anybody touching the Kennewick man because of the secrets and truths the Kennewick man holds. And that just seems to be the way of it over and over and over again. So in April 2005, Senator John McCain got involved. <clears throat> and anybody who knows anything about John McCain knows what a self-serving traitorous so-and-so he was. And that this world and this country are far better off without him and people like him. He introduced and later pushed through an amendment to that NAGPRA uh, that I talked about earlier. Uh, it was Senate Bill 536, which in Section 108 would change the definition of Native American from being that which, quote, is indigenous to the United States to is or was indigenous to the United States. <laughs> Now that's very interesting because it's very possible that the reason he passed that would so that it would make it far easier for uh, Indian tribes to claim um, the skeletons of like Kennewick man so that they could bury it and nobody could be able to touch it basically forever. Uh, I think a bill like that, though, is going to backfire. And one thing they said is what, that it didn't, it didn't make any difference concerning Kennewick Man. Well, for one thing, Kennewick Man was already uh, pretty much so involved in so many different legal disputes that, yeah, it wouldn't have made a big difference. But, I mean, rest assured, if McCain has anything to do with anything... <laughs> Um, it's sleazy, it's scummy, it's selfish, and somebody who owned him his whole life put him up to it. So he goes on to say that in 2005, there was a group of leading scientists in the nation that were allowed to study it, Kennewick Man in Seattle for 10 days, and don't think for a second these guys didn't have pressure on them to produce results that were uh, more pleasing to their higher-ups. Most of these guys are going to work for government funding or they're going to work for universities who have agendas to keep the status quo because of who usually owns or is heavily financing these universities. Now there was one guy, um, Loring Brace, a professor of anthropology at the University of Michigan. He he claims that the skeleton was from a people called the Ainu of Japan. Interesting, there's that prefix again, I, like in the Bible, I, talking about a land across the sea, the I or the I of the Yam, uh, I.e. Yam, and they call it the islands of the sea. Well, anyways, he talks about the I being uh, a Japanese people who were hunted into extinction by probably the people that currently exist as Japanese in Japan now. He says the Ainu don't look like other Japanese. They have light skin, wavy uh, hair, and body hair, and their eyes don't look Asian at all. Uh, well, I don't know how much they actually know about these Ainu. I find it really interesting that for um, Sylvie from the New Earth Channel uh, did a video concerning samurai and who we think of as samurai and shogun and Japanese and, ha and, and showing all of these old photos that show people that are Caucasoid in the samurai garb. So... I have been wondering this for a long time, that where did these Eastern peoples, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, um, Indian, anyone with cultures, and cultures that seem to be extremely old, 
where did they inherit their cultures from? And I think that, for instance, um, what Sylvie has brought to light concerning the ancient of old white samurais is one of the missing pieces. So anyways, let's wrap this up. They're out of all the findings by those 10 very likely all controlled scientists. They only released a little bit of their findings. So there's all kinds of stuff that they determined about this uh, skeleton that they won't even release. Now, how is it that so much of that information is not okay for, for, for the public to know? You have to ask yourself again, how damaging is it to their narrative? Who are the people that they are so actively trying to suppress, breed out, kill off, immoralize or demoralize? Who are those people? He says that today Kennewick Man is stored in boxes in the Burke Museum's basement at a premium of $30,000 a year. Who's paying for that? Who's paying for that? Because I think the people paying for it are the ones who have the right to say, we want to know everything about this. We would like to see independent scientists that are not beholden to a university that has an agenda, who is not funded by government grants, and thus um, beholden to them to produce results that are pleasing to them. I think the people paying for it, and the people paying for everything, are the people of the United States of America, and most specifically the whites of America. That's who's paying for everything. You don't like it? <laughs> Tough. Uh, he talks a little bit about some of the comparisons of Kennewick Man and, and other uh, remains found. Uh, again, there was a skull, f uh, a skeleton, I'm sorry, found on Alaska's Prince of Wales Island. Again, there were local tribes that got involved that, I mean, they just couldn't wait to bury this thing. And again, like, who gives a crap? Yes, no, you don't understand. They are, are just so dedicated to making sure that uh, all of their ancestral remains are buried in a proper way that They'll get involved in legal battles. They'll hire attorneys. We all know that uh, the Indians in North America are not loaded with money, but they can afford these attorneys. They can afford these legal battles just to bury these skeletons. Yeah, that doesn't stink like yesterday's garbage. So um, a lot of what else he has to say past this, again, is, is going back to um, a lot of his own um, opinions. And anybody can get this book uh, at Archive, The Suppressed History of America by Paul Schrag, and you can read it for yourself. Uh, the areas that I don't want to cover, you can find. And, and a lot of it is really good stuff. I'm not even saying that I'm not covering it because it's not good. It is. There's a lot of really good stuff in here. But I'm just not covering it for the sake of time. And I don't want to spend forever uh, on this little series. I really want to wrap it up. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to wrap it up with this one or if I'm just going to spend just one more talking about the death of Meriwether Lewis and uh, the politics of himself and others because there was a lot going on in the United States around this time. Uh, one thing I will mention before I wrap this up is he does talk about the inconsistencies of artifacts found in Illinois and Indiana at a lot of sites like coal sites 
Um, by the way, there are also uh, areas of kaolin mining in Illinois and Indiana. Kaolin is that white clay that is used to make, for one thing, China, but another thing, you can make the hardest bricks there are out of kaolinite. And there are plenty of places in Illinois and Indiana that mine kaolinite. Uh, the biggest area in the United States for kaolinite is said to be Georgia, but there's a lot of it that comes from Illinois and Indiana. Also, coal mines and other types of mineral uh, mines in Illinois and Indiana. And you wouldn't believe the amount of artifacts, not only found by those mining these areas, but also by just regular old farmers. The problem is they will so often turn these things over to local museums that will contact the Smithsonian, turn them over to them, and they disappear forever. There's tons of them. And, I mean, this is where you, you have to understand, this is where some of the oldest and most important independent finds uh, have been made is in the Midwest, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan area. Um, Hebrew artifacts, so-called Phoenician uh, Aramaic artifacts in that area of the Midwest. Uh, again, most of them suppressed, most of them erroneously given over to local museums, local universities who will give them over to the Smithsonian and then poof, they're gone from everybody's memory and history. Um, but the only really important point is how he points out that the, the depths that certain artifacts are discovered at and the things that they're discovered within completely contradict the entire historical narrative of the world and ages of the world. Imagine that. Imagine that. So, uh, speaking of that, if I don't make another video before, don't forget to join Chip Wilman and I Sunday, 6 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, because Chip's in Australia. We've got to make this uh, comfortable for him as well. Uh, he's going to be talking about his recent travels. And you know what? We're going to talk about kind of a, a bunch of things. Very interesting uh, items just in the whole realm of history and chronology and astronomy and assumptions. And maybe we'll talk some about language too. So until next time, take care everybody.